Thanks, Alex. How y'all doing? It's amazing. You have tremendous stamina. I'm just really impressed. Um, a few years ago, I was sitting in an audience much like we are today, and I'd been waiting an hour for the speaker. Uh, we didn't do that bad today, did we? Uh, and I was really excited to hear this speaker. And everybody else in the audience was excited too. In fact, there was a great vibe in the room despite the fact we'd been waiting for an hour. And when, when this man finally came out, he was, he was little and old, and, and he walked very slowly, and he walked to the center of the stage, and he sat down on the floor, and he said nothing. For one minute, he just looked at us. Two minutes went by. He's still just looking at us. Three minutes went by. He said nothing. And then he let out this laugh. <laughs> like that. And His uh, Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, was ready to begin his lesson. And yet something extraordinary had happened in those three minutes. We felt like, and I asked other people in the audience, and they all said the same thing, he connected with me. He did something. I, I had a real relationship with him. He had enormous authenticity. He had enormous charisma. And I wondered, how did he do that? And, and I've got to figure out how to bottle and sell that, and that's very cool. Every communication is two conversations, always. It's the content, and we've been talking a lot about that today. You guys are all about content. You're brilliant. You've got fabulous ideas. And then it's this other conversation, the body language. And when those two are aligned, you can be an effective communicator. You can be authentic, and you can even maybe be charismatic. When those two are not aligned, what happens? What happens? Excellent. Good words. I love them. Cognitive distance. Yeah, you're confused. You're puzzled. It, it, something's not right. What happens is, when you sort that out, people believe the nonverbal every time. The nonverbal always trumps the verbal. And so we're going to spend a few minutes, and I'm going to talk about both how to put together great content and how to manage your delivery, but understand that the second part, that second conversation, always trumps the first. So make sense? A couple of tips about each. Everybody happy with that? Very cool. So I always say the only reason to give a speech is to change the world. And that seems particularly true for this, for this audience, because you really are about changing the world. And when you get up to give a speech, the good news is you've got that opportunity, and that's tremendous. The bad news is you've got a lot of information you want to get across. Right? How many think of their speech as, or presentation, or whatever you want to call it, as an opportunity to present a lot of information? I see a couple of hands going up. Yeah, You've got a lot you want to get across. Here's the problem with that. All the studies show we remember about 10 to 30 percent of what we hear. It's a really lousy way to present information, giving a speech. So you're doomed before you start. So what you need to do is recast it in your mind and say to yourself, I'm not there to give uh, information. That's not primarily my job. My job is to persuade. My job is to move that audience from point A, which is pre-me, <laughs> before I've given my presentation, to point B, which is hopefully signing up, saying yes, being enthusiastic, whatever it is you want to get out of them. And what you're doing then is taking your audience on a decision-making journey from point A to point B. And if you redefine your speech as that, it has a very different effect and a very different way of thinking about it for you. So it's not primarily about, about information. It's primarily about changing the minds of the audience. So what does that suggest? First. You've got to know that audience better than anything else, better than you know yourself. You've got to know, what is that audience afraid of? What does that audience want? What does that audience fear? What does that audience love? What is that? You've got to know everything about that audience, because until you are 
really keyed into what that audience's needs are, you're not ready to talk to them. So that's the first thing. So you've got to understand that audience. And then the second thing is, think about your information as, uh, as the, uh, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, it's been a long day. Don't think about the information as something you're going to present to the audience. Ask yourself instead, what is the problem the audience has for which my information is the solution? And if you do it that way, if you start thinking about that problem and you talk to the audience about that, then they will listen to your information in a different way. Rather than thinking of it as a list, as a bunch of stuff I've got to remember, and you know the studies show you can remember about seven things, somewhere between two and seven. As soon as you hear the seventh, you forget the first. So um, uh, rather than that, think about it as, as uh, that problem-solving thing that you're offering to the audience. Much better way to go about it. Because if the audience is keyed in and thinking, yeah, this guy is great, or this, this gal has, has the, the solution to my problem, then that we're going to hear that data that you're giving us in a different way. It's not going to be uh, it's not going to be a long tiresome list. It's going to be a set of criteria to match against that problem. Make sense? One other thing to think about. So you all know uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Everybody, everybody's heard of Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. What Maslow said was. Uh, people have these set of needs and they work their way up from physiology to safety to esteem to love to, what's the top one, self-actualization? Yeah. And his goal was to get everybody in society up there at self-actualization, working on their golf handicap or their uh, poetry or something like that. But the, the inverse of that for communicators is that we only really pay attention to stuff that's way down there on that, on that hierarchy. So if I'm thinking, if I'm sitting in the audience and thinking about a safety issue, am I going to be in business? Am I going to make a profit? Then if you're talking to me about self-actualization, if you're saying this is a nice technology to have because it's really clean and it's going to make uh, you feel good and, and pious and um, um, happy to use it, am I going to pay attention? No, because I'm way down there in Maslow's hierarchy wondering if I'm going to be able to put bread on the table tomorrow. So what you want to do is drive that presentation down on Maslow's hierarchy. Get it as low as you can. Get it to the safety issue if you can. Don't, don't make it up. Don't fake it. Don't pretend that it's about safety if it isn't. But if it is, make sure you make that clear. Because that's going to be far more uh, engaging. It's going to be viscerally engaging for the audience. Any questions about that? I want to move on to uh, the other thing, the, uh, the nonverbal stuff. Questions about how to put together a presentation. Think of it in terms of problem and solution. Uh, the ancient Greeks thought that up, uh, and it's worked well for about 2,000 years. Uh, say more. I'm not really sure yet what the question is. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. So the, the question is, how do you I interact, how do you read an audience, if you will, that has perhaps multiple objectives, if there are three or four people and they all want different things? Right? Uh, how do you prioritize that? Yeah, um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's another discussion. It's a whole separate uh, seminar on, on reading body language and being able to figure out who the, the uh, alpha male or female is in the room and knowing, therefore, who the decision maker is. Uh, but uh, you all remember uh, 
that fascinating discussion with Tony Blair and, and Bill Gates last night. Did you notice the alpha male behavior that was going on? It was very cool to watch. So uh, 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 Tony Blair, is it all right if I, I talk about him? You, you're, you're okay with that? Uh, so Tony Blair, for most of the first part of that discussion, was, was all alpha male. His head was higher than everybody else's. Um, everybody else was uh, sinking a little bit lower so as not to, to uh, take over uh, Tony's space. Uh, he stretched out his legs to take up more space that way. He had his arms out like this, a uh, very Winston Churchill moment. Um, so he was doing everything he could to take up a lot of space, and he was talking about the, the po political stuff that he was interested in. As soon as the subject switched to the technology, uh, Tony completely disengaged. His body language said, whoops, I'm out of here. And he didn't check back in until the discussion turned to how good a father you all were. And then did anybody notice what he did? He put his head and he got down, he was the lowest person in the room. And he was saying, quite honestly and directly, everybody else is a better dad than I am. It was a fascinating, real human moment. I loved it. It was very cool to see. So yeah, you can tell from watching the body language who the decision makers are, who's in charge, and how that ebbs and flows during the course of a conversation. Uh, but that's already body language, and, and uh, we're switching over. Any other questions about just a very few quick tips on how to put together a presentation. All right, let's move on. But did that answer your question? Sort of? Okay. Yeah, we, we could talk later if you want. Yeah. All right, so there was a study done about 30 years ago that really began the, the modern um, um, communications research by a guy named Albert Morabian. And uh, it, was a, it was a little study, um, not very impressive, and it got blown way out of proportion um, and, in fact, got misinterpreted for many years, and I'm going to give it to you straight tonight. It's, it has been replicated, and now there's a lot more evidence that says that the, the results are robust. So we can, we can take the, uh, the results, even though at the time it was a small, a small study. But what Moravian sought to do was, was to figure out how we decode other people's intent um, and, and their attitudes, their, their emotions. So this wasn't about what they said, but what they really meant about what they said. So uh, he said there were three areas that you might get that information from. The verbal, by which he meant the content, you might get some information from the content. The vocal, by which he meant the tone of voice. And then visual, everything else. And I wonder if you can take a guess as to what uh, percentage came from each one, and we probably have a CFO in the room, so it has to add up to 100. Who wants to take a guess? All right. Visual is 60? 30 and vocal is 60. 30 and 10. Fascinating. Anybody else? Different set of numbers. Oh, sorry. 80, are we going bottom up or top down? 80? 15-5. Really smart splitting the difference, yeah. Anybody else want to do a really different, uh, different set of numbers? Any believers in content? Oh, wait a minute. I thought you were all believers in content. What happened here? Cool. All right. Well, the actual numbers were eerily close to uh, the first uh, gentleman, 55, 38, and 7. And the way this got misinterpreted, people said, well, so I get it. It doesn't matter what you say. It's just how you look. And that's not what this says. What this says is that when the message and the clues about the intent underneath the message align, then people are clear. They, uh, the message comes through. And when they're not, people believe this stuff, because that's where they're getting their information from. So since this is the biggest category, let me, uh, let me break this down a little bit and show you what the research since tells you about this cate these categories. And I'm going to break it up into uh, posture, because we know something about that now. Gesture, very important, and motion. And, uh, uh, we'll just do a little bit on each one. And to take the, uh, the first one, 
I need a volunteer. Somebody who isn't cur currently in therapy and, and is uh, pretty well grounded. Yes? You are? Brent. Brent, thank you. Uh, come up here, Brent. And if you'll just stand right there. Perfect. You're, you're where you are. Now, uh, I'm going to introduce myself to Brent three times. And your job is much more difficult You're to tell me what I'm thinking. Everybody got it? Read my mind. All right. Brent, nice to meet you. How you doing? All right, what was I thinking? Sorry? My back hurts, yeah. <laughs> the, I don't want to meet him. Yeah, thanks. The New Zealand literist, I like that, yeah. Yeah. I'm inferior. All right, so I don't want to meet him. I'm perhaps unhappy about the situation, or I'm inferior. So a lot of, lot of emotional attitude, um, none of it good. Non -con that's right, yeah, I might uh, be trying to avoid a confrontation with him. All right, great. Yeah. Brent, nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes people go very PC on me at that moment. I don't know why. That's how, I appreciate the frank comment back there. Yeah, I look like I'm trying to seduce him. That's straight to the point and saves us a lot of time. Thanks for that. All right, number three. Brent, nice to meet you. He doesn't say much, does he, this guy? <laughs> so what was I thinking? Confidence and equal. Yeah, so you got lots of good vibes that time. All right. Thank you. A big hand for Brent here. I, I really hope you don't have to go into therapy. I appreciate that. So all I did there was I changed my posture slightly three times. The first time I used what we call the head posture, which seen from the side meant I was leading with my head. Now here's the thing about that. People who have a lot on their minds tend to lead with their heads. Uh, and people who sit at computers and do stuff all day then get up and tend to walk this way. And people who are really worried about important meetings or pitches, say, tend to walk into those meetings or pitches like this. Because you've got a lot in your mind, and you're carrying it around. And so that's what you lead with. And the, the, the problem with that is, as you saw, it's read as inferior, non-confrontational, um, lots of things, but none of them good. You've been sitting there so long patiently. Why don't you stand up and let's do a little exercise to get rid of that head posture just in case you have it. So a quick way, before you go into a meeting, just to make sure, a little check on yourself, to make sure you're not walking in uh, with loser uh, on, your, on your forehead. Um, uh, stand there for a sec. Just raise your hands over your head like this. And drop them to your sides. I can't quite do it because I'll destroy the microphone here. But. Yeah, great. So for a split second there, before you went back into your 4 o'clock slump, uh, you had beautiful uh, upright um, body language. Now, let me run you through the, uh, the, uh, the full detail. So if you'll stand with uh, your feet about shoulder width apart, um, and then roll your lower back forward, tuck in your stomach. Sorry? Do it on the stage? Oh, great point, yeah. For everybody in the cheap seats, I'll start again. Stand with your, uh, with your feet about shoulder width apart. Roll your lower spine forward. Tuck in your pelvis and your stomach. Throw your shoulders back a little bit. And then uh, roll them so you don't get too much tension in them. Not like a soldier who stands with uh, rigid shoulders. You want to be a little bit relaxed there. And then finally, get the magical yoga string out. And uh, Oh, I love that. And, and uh, imagine that your head is being pulled high. And that's really the secret, is the high head. You can be four foot two and carry this off and look confident. And you can be six foot eight and, and let your head come down like this and look uh, like you have no confidence at all. So uh, the height doesn't matter. What matters is how you hold your head. Don't bring your chin up too far, because then you look like you're ready for a fight. Right. Surprising to me. Usually when I'm hearing a pitch, in the first 60 seconds, I actually decide whether I'm going to pay attention or not. It's, uh, it, it, no, seriously. Uh, 
I decided that... <laughs> and, and Vinod is kind because the, the studies show people make up their minds in about 30 seconds. And it is based on that quick take of how you look. So the point about this posture is that it's, it happens before you even open your mouth, just walking in the room. That's why it's important to get it right. So have a seat. Thanks. You, uh, you all look great now. Um, and just quickly, the second posture, the, the one that got me accused of uh, soliciting there was, uh, was uh, leading with my pelvis. The third one, what you just did, was the heart posture. Uh, and when, when you stand with a heart posture, something fun happens between you and your audience. They trust you. There was a great study done about what audiences want, and it was trust and credibility. And the cool thing about that is trust and credibility both are conveyed uh, through body language, and trust comes from having an open, upright torso. Sounds strange, but it's that simple. Remember, we are hardwired uh, animals, and we rate people instinctively and unconsciously with our unconscious minds very, very quickly, faster than conscious thought. All right, so let's talk about gesture for a split second. Can we uh, roll that first, first clip, please? Keep your fingers crossed. Very quick story. Watch what he does with his hands. Thank you. <laughs> we only have an hour, so uh, let's get going. Uh, isn't it incredible we're going to go up in satellites? You and me. Uh, I think we can make it happen. And the first thing before we go into satellite, now you've seen my new jacket, and I'm going to take it off, okay? <laughs> uh, just a little while ago, about a, six or seven months ago, one of my neighbors told me of a little church uh, near my home where they said beautiful spiritual things went on and they wanted me to go and experience it with them. So I told them I'd love to and we went there and no sooner we opened the door of this little church and everybody reached out for me and they took my hand and, and they pet my shoulder and they felt my hair. It was an absolute freak out right at the door, you know. And then they brought me in and there was a lot of singing and a lot of moving around and dancing. And it was a real celebration, sort of the kind of religious experience that some of us really think about and dream about but don't very often experience. But the high point came when the minister uh, stood up and he said, uh, friends, he said, um, Brother Jonathan is going to give the sermon today. And uh, his subject is going to be faith. And so I sat back ready to hear this and little brother Jonathan stood up and he was about five foot four and he had no hair and he had two beady wonderful Kris Kringle eyes and he stood before everybody for a minute like this and then he folded his hands and he said, faith, 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 faith. <laughs> and then he sat down and the minister stood up, and with a big smile on his face, he said, Thank you, Brother Jonathan, Jonathan, for that beautiful lecture on faith. And I thought, you know, someday I'm going to wise up, and when I go to talk to people like I am tonight about love, I'm going to fold my hands and I'm going to say, Love, 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 love. And then I'm going to go home. So what did you see? Right, hands, hair, yeah, uh, Chris Kringle eyes, yeah. Yeah, uh, extraordinary ability to tell a story with the hands. Uh, he is Italian-American, so that gives him a leg up on everybody else. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, what happens is when we get adrenaline in our systems, we tend to lose affect and we tend to stand still. Uh, the other effect is that we get happy feet and wander around. That's not so great either. But uh, uh, we tend to lose that affect. We tend to lose the hand gestures. We inhibit our hand gestures. And those gestures are extraordinarily important for us to understand what it is you're saying, understand the emotional intent behind what you're saying. And the reason for that is the way the brain works is, is uh, uh, contrary to sort of what common sense tells us. We all imagine we have this little director in our head, right, who says, OK, I'm thirsty, so I should reach over and grab that glass of water and drink. Or I should walk over here and meet that person. 
But in fact, what happens is we get an, an intent or an emotion or an urge, like thirst, deep in the uh, lower, older part of the brain. And then we get a gesture. And then only after that, nanoseconds after that, do we get uh, the conscious thought. So it's literally the case that our conscious brains, the ones we're so proud of and that we think run our lives, actually spend a lot of time explaining to ourselves why we've just made the decision that we have unconsciously. So if you inhibit those gestures, then you deprive your audience of the ability to read you and to decide that you're uh, authentic, credible, uh, and perhaps even charismatic. And basically what you saw there, in addition to those really interesting, wonderful gestures telling the story, was you saw an, uh, a speaker who opened up toward the, uh, toward the end, uh, but who, if he brought his hands together like this, basically he kept bringing them back out here. Now the reason for that is that allows him to be open to the audience and that's what builds the trust. And the urge is when we stand up in front of an audience is to do this or this, we've seen a lot of this today. Um, it's self-protective, it feels comfortable, but here's the problem with that. This worked really well in the cave person era when we were ready at a moment's notice to take flight or to protect ourselves from woolly mammoths and uh, uh, saber-toothed tigers. But today, we have to stand up in front of an audience and connect with them and make them trust us. And so that same behavior, which is self-protective and comfortable, what it actually does is it starts a chain of association in the minds of the audience because we have these things called mirror neurons in our, in our heads which fire the same emotion that we see somebody else experiencing. It literally imitates it. And so the result is that uh, if you see somebody at the front of the, uh, of the uh, audience, a speaker, come in and start doing this and being nervous and being defensive, is you, you get frightened too. And the beauty of this is it's unconscious, you're not even aware of it, but already fight or flight has set in and the possibility of a good, strong, open communication between the, uh, you and the audience has gone down the tubes and you probably haven't even opened your mouth yet. Do you want to know the good news? <laughs> good news is uh, you can fight that, you can train yourself, you can open up um, and work on keeping your gestures open and uh, reaching toward the audience rather than the opposite. All right, one more point. Uh, can you run the last uh, clip, please? Or, uh, the next clip, sorry. This is about another bit of, another bit of wiring we all have. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for that wonderful warm welcome, and thank you, Governor Wilson, for your very kind words of introduction. Now, you know, tradition is that speakers at the Republican National Convention remain at this very imposing podium, but tonight I'd like to break with tradition for two reasons. One, I'm going to be speaking to friends, and secondly, I'm going to be speaking about the man I love. And it's just a lot more comfortable for me to do that down here with you. <laughs> so watch this. Uh, Mr. Governor, how are you doing tonight? Great. Doing great. All right. That's it. Can you kill the clip? Now, for, for the last several days, a number of men and women have been painting a remarkable portrait you, uh, of a remarkable man. Thank you. So, what did you see there? Uh, she shook the governor of Kansas' hand. Yeah, yeah. She reached out to him. What does that do? Engages. Yeah. So, uh, what she's saying is that, that she, he, enga uh, she engaged with the audience by shaking the governor of Kansas' hand, got down to their level, uh, and that's all absolutely right. Uh, interestingly, everybody in that hall was galvanized and said she should run for president, not her husband. Um, but it didn't have the same effect for people on TV. Why is that, watching it on television? Why do you suppose that is? 
No, it's because she was already framed for you in head and shoulders shot, which means you read that, your unconscious minds read that as being in that space. So she was already there up on the podium for you. But for the audience, it was a very real and, and extraordinary transformation. See, we all have these z zones of space, four zones of space between us. 12 feet or more is public space. 12 feet to 4 feet is social space. 4 feet to a foot and a half, personal space. And a foot and a half to zero is intimate space. Now, here's what's important about that. The only significant things that happen between people happen in intimate and personal space. If, we're, if you're more than 12 feet away from me, in terms of my unconscious mind, I don't care because I can react if you start coming toward me. It's all about safety. It's the way we're wired. As soon as you get into personal space, however, look what happens. His eyes come up away from this really cool new toy that he's got here, and he starts paying attention. He can't help himself. He's wired that way. Now watch what happens when I get into <laughs> intimate space. <laughs> I did that once, and, and the woman literally hit me. So. And then she was mortified. She said, no, thank you. That was great. Was, um, we don't go into intimate space. That's not, the, that's not appropriate in a public setting. Apologies. Um, but So we do have that personal space to use. And here's the thing. If you don't get into that personal space of at least some members of the audience, they're not, you're not going to engage that group. Nothing significant will happen between you and them. So my challenge to you is to choreograph your speeches and your presentations so that you can use that personal space in some natural-looking, tactful way uh, by figuring out what's the important point I'm making, moving toward the audience when you're making that important point, selling it to somebody in the audience, and then only moving away when you're done. Use your body as a punctuation mark. So put those three things together, posture, gesture, and motion, and you're well on the way to making a really strong impression with your, uh, with your body language, that second conversation. And with that, I'll stop. And I'm, if we have time, I'll be happy to take any questions, or I'll just get the heck off the stage. Yeah? You know, I always get asked that question. I love that because the, the idea seems to be we stop being human when we sit down at a conference table. Actually, all the same rules apply. It's just they're in a narrower scope. Uh, I was once working with a bunch of uh, IT uh, researchers, and it was a group of 12 of them. And the guy who brought me in and said, Morgan, if uh, you're as good as you think you are, uh, one of these guys was trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, and I want you to tell me which one it was. And I thought, you know, what the hell? Uh, how would I know what his resume was based on looking at him for a few minutes? But, you know, the thing was, it was obvious within about 30 seconds. Because there was one guy who was using his body. He was sitting down at the chair, and he was moving into the public space, which is the uh, crossing the vertical line over the conference table, right, when he wanted to talk. And he would gesture and move, just, just bend into that space. And then when he was done, he would move back like that. He did it very subtly, but he controlled the entire conversation for the hour of that meeting just by moving his body back and forth like that and using his hands to sculpt the air. And it was that extraordinary acting training that he'd had that made it easy for him to do that. Uh, so the answer is you can still use it's a diminished palate, if you will, but you can still use your body to uh, influence uh, the debate. You can still move toward people and away uh, from people and still build trust and credibility that way. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the interesting thing is we used to think that body language was entirely culturally determined. Uh, and, and what uh, the researchers have shown in the last 15 or 20 years is that there is a base, the, the kind of body language I've been talking about is universal. Uh, and there's a base of universal body language. And then there's a layer on top of that of, of the culturally determined things, like the difference between bowing and shaking hands, for example, that sort of thing. And what you need to do is to, is to educate yourself in the local um, in the local culture so that you understand what the taboos are and, and lines not to cross. But that the basic stuff about uh, the four zones, we all have four zones. They, they vary slightly uh, 
depending on culture, but, but not much. It's astounding. And it, again, it's because we're hardwired to respond to safety issues uh, for that reason. Yeah. Uh, well, the answer to that, unfortunately, is, is bad news that uh, this is broadband, right? And this is dial-up. And it, it just, it's a really lousy way to try to convince anybody of anything over the phone. And what happens is it all goes into your tone of voice. Uh, and most of us have pretty nasty voices because we don't exercise enough. We spend too much time sitting in chairs, which is a really uh, a bad way to, uh, to nurture the voice. So uh, do we have time? I can teach one voice trick. Yeah, yeah. All right, stand up, everybody. Let's do a voice trick. <laughs> so very quickly, uh, what we detest in voices is the nasal voice. How when the voice sounds like this, when it goes up into the nose, we hate it, right? We can't stand to listen to it. It's like a dentist drill. We want to get out of there. We, 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 yeah, all right, you get it. So, uh, and the problem with it is when you sit down and you don't breathe, that's where your voice tends to go. The more time you spend sitting, the more likely your voice is to get nasal. So instead, you have to fight that. Uh, and if you've done yoga or if you've had training as a singer, you'll know about this. You need to breathe from your belly. We call this belly breathing. Um, and it's the opposite of how you normally breathe. So you breathe in and expand your stomach. You can look at mine. Don't look at each other's because it's embarrassing when you do this. Um, uh, breathe in through your stomach. Tense those muscles and then, and then force the air out. Um, <laughs> no rude remarks here. I told you not to look. Um, so, uh, so do that. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath and, and uh, take the air in here. So I should go up on the stage? Is that what uh, the hint is? Yeah. Now everybody's going to see my stomach, yes. So take a deep breath down here. Pretend this is an eyedropper uh, and you're expanding it. And then tense these muscles and squeeze the air out here. By the way, if anybody gets tense or nervous when they speak, this is a great thing to do just before you start. Take about three of these deep breaths. So, Big breath in like this, and then tense these muscles like you're being punched in the stomach, right? And let the air trickle out this way. That's a great way of grounding yourself and calming your nerves if you practice that over time. Uh, and also, if you hold these muscles tense, then the tension, which tends to gather in other places, like your, your face and your hands, uh, perhaps your heart, uh, if, you're, if you're deliberately uh, collecting the tension here, then you'll find it, it typically goes away elsewhere and you'll lose your nerves. So it's a great, great little trick to, to do before you get started. Uh, but that's, that's belly breathing. That's how you avoid uh, that nasal voice, uh, which is uh, uh, the bane of phone conversations these days um, and uh, in, improve the, uh, the quality of what comes through. Everybody know how to breathe? Have a seat. Yeah. Uh, that's a great, uh, a great point. When I'm on a phone conference, that's what I do is I stand up, I walk around, I smile a lot because smiling changes the length of your vocal cords and gives it a warmer tone. So I look like, I look like I'm insane, but uh, uh, nobody else sees, right, because they're all on the phone. So that's okay. Yeah, so that's a very good way to do it. Also keeps you more active. Yeah. The question was, how do you manage a heckler, an antagonistic audience? So if you've got somebody who really won't shut up, uh, then if you walk over to them and align yourself with them, but stay taller, then only a psychopath can keep talking and heckling you <laughs> under these circumstances. How do you feel? <laughs> well, then you haven't judged your audience well, and you need to go back and start again. Back to first principles, yeah. yeah. What if it is a psychopath? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, then good luck to you is all I can say, yeah. Yes? Oh, that's a great observation. Uh, yeah, Tony Blair's the, uh, of the two, yeah. uh, let's say he presents a little better. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yet, uh, can I say this out loud? In, in the long run, I found Bill Gates absolutely fascinating. 
because he's such a smart guy. He held me with his, uh, with his mind, even though his body language was terrible. <laughs> yeah, and what happens there is, um, uh, the, the point there is that somebody like a Bill Gates or a President of the United States or, or a Prime Minister has a lot of authority to give up. And so when they give up a little bit, of that's charming. Uh, when you come in uh, hat in hand asking for money, if you start giving up authority, that's not charming, that's just pathetic. So that's the difference. Um, so, so hang on to whatever authority you've got, right? <laughs> that one, thing that, um, one thing we see all the time is uh, the tendency when you're feeling a little uncertain is to tip your head to one side uh, like this. Uh, and uh, women tend to do this a little bit more than men, but men do it too. Uh, and what that does is that gives up authority. We, we do a lot of work in the healthcare uh, industry and, and, and of course the uh, nurses who are now have become uh, executives are all do this because this is, uh, you know, tell me where it hurts, right? It's very thoughtful, it's sensitive, it's asking for a response, but it's not authoritative. So uh, uh, check out if you're going in with a team, make sure everybody's got their head up straight because uh, that's authoritative. And we can measure tiny changes, by the way, in the distance between us and other people and what, uh, and the shape, uh, what we do with our heads and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. So how do you reconnect when you feel like you've lost it? So you must do a lot of reading of body language because you're asking questions about uh, that's, that's really interesting about how to, how to reestablish things. So there are a couple of things to do. Yeah, all right, so there are a couple of things to do. One is to, uh, is to pause at that point and say, I, I want to stop here and just take the temperature of the room and, and ask for questions, right? And, and what you want to do when you sense that you've lost the room is, cha is change it up, change your tempo, do something different at that point. Uh, and you can always uh, reconnect with people by going into personal space, so that's a, a simple nonverbal way to do it. Great, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, we'll do it later. All right, thank you. Yeah, okay.